Hello and welcome back to part 5 of Nintendo Torn Down. In parts 1 through 4 we took a look at all the versions of the Japanese Famicom and the US Nintendo Entertainment System and the Japanese Super Famicom and the US Super Nintendo Entertainment System. In part 5 here we're going to be taking a look at the internals of the Nintendo 64 which is Nintendo's third home console released in 1996. And if we take a look at the bottom here you'll see that uh, just like the uh, Super Famicom and Super Nintendo Entertainment System, it's held together by several security screws. The larger kind, so you're going to need your 4.5 millimeter security bit to open the system. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six. Six security screws securing the console together. I've already taken all six screws out. A little bit of a uh, thing to note here is that these two security screws are actually holding on the plastic feet, which is kind of an interesting design here. The Nintendo 64 has feet on the front of the console. So once you take those off, you can flip the console over, and, huh, that's not coming apart. Well, the reason for that is there's one more thing that you're going to have to take a look at in order to get the Nintendo 64 apart, and that is the memory expansion port. Once you take the expansion port cover off, you're going to be uh, confronted with one of two things. Either the original jumper that was installed at the factory, and it usually has a purple sticker over it, or the actual uh, memory expansion pack that was included with the Donkey Kong 64 game or bought separately. And this expansion pack was uh, available to accommodate games like Donkey Kong 64 that required extra memory to run smoothly. And there's two ways that you can get this expansion pack out of here. The first and recommended way is using the little tool that Nintendo provided with the Donkey Kong 64 game or the expansion pack uh, if you bought it separately. And in order to do that, all you do is insert it with the Nintendo 64 logo facing you and use it as kind of a lever to pry the expansion pack up. And I found that sometimes it works best if you use two hands. Some units are a little bit easier to get out of than others. But there, just using it as a lever, you can get the expansion pack out, or in this case, it's the jumper pack. This is what was included originally. Now, if you don't have this little tool, which I imagine might be the case, because this is a small piece of plastic that I'm sure a lot of people lost somewhere along the line, we put the jumper pack back in. You can separate the jumper pack from its connector just by kind of wiggling the bottom and the top half of the uh, Nintendo 64 shell. Once you do get all six screws out, you'll notice there's a little bit of play in between the two pieces. If you have fingernails, just kind of get in between there. Maybe put your thumb on the N64 logo, and if you pull gently, it will come apart eventually. So, here we have the top shell of the Nintendo 64. And this is one of the only differences between the US and the Japanese uh, Nintendo 64 system. This gray piece right here uh, is the uh, kind of cartridge holder. It positions the cartridge correctly in the slot. And this gray piece is unique to the US model in where these tabs lie because they align with the external shell of a cartridge for uh, US games. And the Japanese version of this is actually black in color and these plastic tabs on the inside are in a different position to accommodate the shell of Japanese games. So in that respect it's kind of a physical region lockout. Another difference I've been told, I don't have first-hand experience with this, between the uh, Japanese N64 and the US N64, is uh, some of the internal uh, workings of the circuit board. It, uh, the Japanese one does not have certain traces or certain components to be able to mod it for an RGB out and the US one does. So people who are into modding, they're going to want the US version, so if they want to do the RGB mod, they'll be able to do that. But if we take a look at the system here, it's rather uh, it's a very simple system, especially if you compare it to uh, its competitors of the time, the PlayStation and the uh, Sega Saturn. This is really a, uh, a very streamlined circuit board. 
We can't see much of it right now because it's covered by this huge heat sink and some shielding and several, several screws. I'm not looking forward to taking all these screws out. In order to do so, you'll probably be using a standard uh, or smaller size uh, Phillips screwdriver. As you can see, just holding the heat sink on alone, there's 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 screws holding on this one piece here. And then once we get this up, you can see there are several more screws. Something to note that uh, is that these two screws right here in the center are a different, uh, different size than the ones holding on the heat sink as are these here holding on a shielding piece for the expansion port. There are two screws going through the expansion port that are yet another different size. And then if you go back here to the AC in and the multi-AV out, there are silver screws. So the N64, unlike many other Nintendo consoles, requires that you really do uh, maybe even take a picture before you uh, take your console apart. Um, uh, to get the screws back in place. It's really important to note where they came from. So give me a moment and I'm going to get those screws out of their sockets. All right, I got all the screws out, at least for the heat sink. And as you can see, the extreme variation in the screws. Got these really long, thin ones that go in uh, through the expansion port. These darker ones that hold on a shield are on the expansion port then these ones with little toothed washers on them that hold on the shield, and then a lot of these little short ones here that uh, hold the heat sink down. So you really do need to be uh, take note of where these screws go so you get them back in the proper location. So I've taken out all the screws here that are not part of the circuit board, including the uh, two screws to the left and right of the, um, of the expansion port. So once you get those screws out, you're going to be able to start removing components. And again, you're going to notice that there are a lot of little shielding pieces, especially around the expansion port area, and you're going to want to remember where those go. So what I do typically is I take the heat sink, just kind of slip it up and remove it. And you can see it's just a piece of uh, bent aluminum, nothing, uh, nothing special. And then what we're left with exposed here is the, uh, the RF shielding for the main circuit board and some of the shielding pieces for the uh, expansion port. So I believe there are two little flaps here. If you get a fingernail underneath, you can remove the three pieces that uh, serve as the shield for the, for the expansion port. And based on their size, you'll be able to kind of, you know, puzzle them back together to get them where they, uh, where, where they originally were. If we take a look at uh, what we can see now, what's exposed here is the motherboard, of course with an RF shield on, and several more screws that we're going to have to remove, noting the silver screws by the uh, multi-AV out and the AC in. We have a total of 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 11 screws that need to be removed still. So, give me a moment to do that. And in addition to the silver screws that I've already talked about, once you get these screws holding the board in out, you're going to notice there are two different sizes. The longer screws go in uh, next to the little metal pieces that uh, hold the uh, 64DD add-on in place. And once we take the uh, main board out here, I'll show you where those go. But anyway, in order to get the main board out, there's this little plastic piece right here holding on the uh, multi-AV out, which will fall off once you get it up over a certain point. You remove that, and then the main board should just lift out like so. It's kind of like an RF shield sandwich. It is in between two pieces of RF shielding. So before we put the bottom piece of the chassis aside, You'll notice there are two metal pieces in here, and those are for the little screw ports on the top of the 64DD system, because this N64 would sit on top of the 64DD, and you'd be able to secure the two together using the screw ports on the 64DD, and this is what those screws fasten into. And then, of course, the interface port on the bottom here, the EXT port, this can be removed. And once you do remove that piece, 
this path, uh, pass through port to the uh, cartridge slot is exposed and that's how the two pieces of hardware interface. So let's take the uh, pieces of shield off. I don't believe they're clipped together in any way. Once you get all the screws out, they should just separate. Like so. And you're left with the N64 main board here. We got the GPU and the PPU on here, the four controller ports, the red LED power light, and what's neat about the chips is that they have uh, heat sinks uh, right on the top of them that are fastened to that big aluminum heat sink. Here's the power and reset switch and button, respectively. And on the bottom of the board, we can see here where the multi-AV out and AC in are soldered right to the board. What is not soldered right to the board, much like the uh, Super Famicom and Super Nintendo Entertainment System, is the cartridge slot. What you can do, like with those systems, is remove the cartridge slot. And unlike the Super Famicom and Super Nintendo Entertainment Systems, the pins just go right through the board making connections here and also connecting with the bottom uh, the bottom cartridge slot for the 64DD add-on. Uh, the Super Famicom and Super Nintendo Entertainment System had a socket that was uh, soldered, uh, soldered right to the board but this one the pins actually go right through and make connections. I imagine that uh, Nintendo didn't want to have the cartridge slot soldered directly to the board just because of all the wear and tear from loading and removing cartridges that this area would experience throughout the lifetime of, uh, of the console. With all that movement it would have been very likely for solder points to crack and break and thus uh, make the connection uh, of the uh, cartridge, uh, cartridge slot very unreliable. So I think this was a, uh, a good method that Nintendo chose to do. I'm not entirely sure if... No, I can see the solder points right here. The uh, bottom port here for the 64DD is actually soldered. And that's probably just the reverse reason of what I just explained. It was going to be uh, connected to the 64DD with a lot less frequency than uh, cartridges would be loaded and removed. So they thought it would be okay to solder that, cart uh, that uh, slot to the board. But this one here for cartridges just inserts like so. So that's the board for the uh, main N64 unit. And speaking of cartridges, we're going to take a look at one of those next. So here we have Donkey Kong 64. I chose this game because it has a nice yellow cartridge, which is atypical for N64 games, or typically gray. In order to open an N64 cartridge, there are two security screws right here at the top. They are the smaller 3.8 millimeter size, so you will need your 3.8 millimeter game bit to open uh, these games. At the bottom, there's two clips, so once you do get the screws out, which I've already done, you just lift from the top and disconnect from the clips, and there's the inside of the cartridge shell. Holding the cartridge and the RF shielding in place are two very small Phillips screws right here where my two index fingers are. I've already removed them. In order to remove the screws, you'll need a jeweler screwdriver or a precision screwdriver. And then the RF shielding will pop off like so and reveal the circuit board to the cartridge. And I think it's interesting that uh, N64 games are shielded. Nintendo's other two cartridge-based systems, the NES and the Super NES, did not have any RF shielding inside the cartridges themselves. I don't know if that's due to interference between the console and the game, or if it has to do with uh, increased uh, requirements from the FCC in the United States, or what have you. But uh, here we see that uh, it is uh, shielded with a lot of RF metal here. You take the actual cartridge out, you see the other part of the RF shielding. And something that's kind of a nice finishing feature is Nintendo included this bit of uh, plastic just so that uh, you wouldn't be able to see up into the, uh, the cartridge while it was put together. So it gives it a very nice finished look. 
This Donkey Kong 64 uh, cartridge is very small, the board is. Uh, games like Mario 64 and uh, Wave Race 64, some of the earlier ones, they all have bigger boards. That's to accommodate a battery. And um, I'm thinking that Donkey Kong 64, since it was released later in the N64's lifespan, uh, that they were finally able to start using uh, flash memory to save uh, game files instead of the lithium-ion batteries. Actually, no, they were nickel-cadmium batteries back then. If you know otherwise, uh, if you can explain why this board is so small, let me know in the comments. But I'm really thinking that uh, the uh, saving technology, the battery saving, was, uh, was upgraded with these, uh, with these games. And uh, batteries were phased out altogether when systems like the GameCube were released. Because, as you know, you can't save to a disc. Nintendo's first disc-based system, the GameCube, used memory cards, which did use flash memory. And we're going to be taking a look at the Nintendo GameCube in the next edition, Part 6. Stay tuned.